So we're delighted to have today with us in our Bar-Ilan University Vision Sciences Seminar, Professor Jeremy Wolf, Professor of Ophthalmology and Radiology at Harvard Medical School. Professor Wolf did his BA in Princeton and a PhD in psychology at MIT under the supervision of Richard Held. He then joined MIT as staff in the Department of Psychology and Brain and Cognitive Sciences. After a decade at MIT, he moved to Harvard Medical School. He serves as the director of the Psychophysical Studies and Center for Clinical Cataract Research for several years now and um, leads the Visual Attention Lab. He published more than 200 original research papers, 16 proceedings, a book, and 39 book chapters and more. His work is highly cited with more than 35,000 citations and an H index of 88 according to Google Scholar. He has been invited to more than 100 conference presentations to give talks in more than 200 colloquia across the world. He has supervised many graduate students, many of which now lead successful um, labs worldwide. His lab routinely hosts summer students from both a program to open the door to biomedical careers to underrepresentative minority high school students and also to international talented to international talented high school students. His lab also regularly hosts visiting scientists from graduate students to researchers from across the world. He has received numerous awards for his research and for his teaching. He is a fellow and an elected fellow in multiple scientific societies. He is on multiple review panels of university and external committees. He has been and still is on many editorial boards of journals and societies as VSS, Psychometric Society, and American Psychological Association, just to name a few. And although I could continue on and on, I think it would be best if I um, invite you now, Jeremy, to tell us more about your exciting research. And thanks for joining us. Okay, well, thank you. I'm going to stand up because that way I don't fall asleep while giving my own talk. Um, it's eight in the morning here in, uh, in Boston and pouring rain and hopefully the garbage truck outside isn't being a disaster. Um, okay, that looks okay. Oh, yeah, and I'm, uh, I will be delighted if, uh, if at least some of you, particularly those with cute small children, uh, leave their cameras on because it's much nicer to give talks to real people than just be talking into your computer in a bunch of black boxes on the, on the screen. So um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'd rather be there, but I'm delighted enough to be here. Um, and I want to start by saying that everything I'll be telling you about today is the product of work by various um, people in my lab who I will attempt to give credit to as we go along. And this is um, people in the lab, not only now, but over multiple years. Um, it's, it's true that uh, many of these people have gone on to exciting careers in various parts of the world, um, but they left behind a, a history of, of really very, uh, of, of work that I get to go and talk about. And I should also thank uh, uh, the funding agencies who've supported this work over the years, notably at the moment, the NIH and uh, the US National Science Foundation. Um, so what am I gonna do this morning? Um, I'm gonna give you a, an introduction to the basics of the guided search model of visual search. I'll tell you in context of guided search about five different forms of, of guidance. I'll tell you uh, something new about the idea of functional visual fields in search. And I'll say something, well, I'll say specifically that there are two types of search templates that it would do us well to keep straight, um, keep straight in our minds when we're thinking about visual search. Um, here is my one concession to the fact that I'm giving a talk in, uh, in Israel. Um, as the Israelis will uh, know, um, this says something to the effect of, what are you seeing, Yermiyahu? 
Um, this is a, a line from the start of the biblical book of, uh, of, of Jeremiah. Conveniently enough, my Hebrew name is in fact Yermiahu, so I clearly this talk is, uh, at least the question, is, is roughly divinely inspired. Um, and we'll start by looking for bugs. So what you should do is uh, look for bugs, look for insects in, um, in this picture. Um, and that's a, a prompt for asking us to think about how much time we spend doing visual search, which is then part of the motivation for why you would study visual search at all. Um, and one might ask why the slides decided to not advance. Um, so I, th I think the answer, if you think about it, is you spend a great deal of time doing search tasks. We don't tend to think about them as search tasks, but every time you go to the fridge and get an egg out of the, uh, out of the refrigerator or, or grab your coffee mug off your desk or ask what the dog has gotten up to and, and so on, these are all search tasks of one variety. It's a significant piece of our daily visual behavior and thus, um, if for no other reason, worth, uh, worth some study. Uh, and what I'm interested in is how you end up doing that searching. What, is, what does that search mechanism, um, that human search engine look like? So if we go back to bugs, if you were uh, dutifully looking for bugs, you have probably discovered that there are quite a lot of bugs. You might have, the FA stands for false alarm. You might have incorrectly found something that wasn't really a bug. Anyway, there's lots and lots of um, bugs here. Um, I'm going to change my mind about standing up because my remote is not working intelligently. So I'm going to come back down to earth here and we'll just have to deal with uh, doing it from a seated position. Um, so the first point you want to make, or I would want to make here is uh, that you needed to search. Um, you didn't immediately see every bug. You might still be discovering more bugs in this uh, image as we talk, uh, as, as we go along. Um, we can make a second point if I get you to look for this bug. I just flashed that scene up briefly. Quite possibly you didn't find the bug, but you certainly saw something and you knew quite a bit about the something that, that, uh, um, that you just saw. You knew, for instance, that the image, that that image on the right at the bottom that I flashed was not the same thing as the original look for bugs image, even though you didn't find the specific target. Um, so this tells us that there is a non-selective pathway in your visual system that shows you something everywhere across the entire visual field, um, as you know, essentially as soon as an image appears. Um, a bit of searching now will uh, let you find the bug. It's not a particularly difficult search task, but you needed to search. And this in turn tells you that there's some sort of selective pathway that allows you to process parts of um, the larger image in a way that allows you to recognize specific objects. But you can't do all of those objects at once. You have to select specific objects and ask whether or not they're, uh, they're uh, bugs or not. So we can, uh, we can say that there are two basic pathways headed up to um, what we can loosely call visual awareness, this non-selective pathway that gives you things in the literature that you might uh, read about, like the ensemble, statistics of an image, the gist of an image and so on. And then a selective pathway that's limited in its capacity that allows you to do um, uh, object recognition sorts of tasks among other things. Uh, so why do we need this selective pathway? If you've got a non-selective pathway that does something everywhere, why have this strongly capac <clears throat> capacity limited 
uh, selective pathway? Why, why do we actually need to search? Um, we can, one of the ways to illustrate that is to uh, use some rather old chickens from my, my lab. These were um, designed years ago when the graphics uh, were not as fancy as they are today. Um, my talents haven't improved, the computer graphics have. But the idea here is that we, uh, I, I created a sort of a chicken made up of um, chicken quarters that I could reassemble into things on the right, at the lower right, that are clearly not chicken. And then I could ask you to find chickens. And uh, well, you could find them. It's not, again, not particularly difficult, but it's not immediately obvious when the image comes up where the chickens are. You have to search. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the question is, why is this not a trivial search? There's no doubt when you look at, it, uh, at, at individual non-chickens that these are easily identifiable as, as um, well, not chickens. Um, why, why is it difficult? Uh, we did to, to, to show that it was actually uh, reasonably difficult and to avoid complaints that this was just a crowding experiment of some sort. When we did the actual experiment, we used displays that looked rather like what's on the display now. We had set sizes. The number of items on the screen was just one, two, three, or four of these chicken or non-chicken items. And the observer pushes one button if they see a chicken and another button if they don't see any chicken. Um, and you get data like this. Each time you add a chicken to the set size, set size on the x-axis, response time in milliseconds on the y-axis, each time you add a chicken to the display, um, it, takes you, uh, it takes you longer, about twice as long for absent trials as for target present trials. Um, this is what we would consider to be an inefficient search. We can unpack what's going on here by using maybe a, 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 a simpler, well, here, let's go back for a second. I want to make the point um, that the reason that these chicken searches are hard is because the chicken parts are uh, the, 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 these not chickens are made up of the same parts as the chicken, and before your attention arrives on the specific chicken, these non chickens and these chickens are essentially the same thing. Pre attentively, without attention, um, they are both bundles of uh, of chicken bits. And you cannot tell what, what the selective pathway is doing for you is allowing you to go through and bind those chicken bits into a coherent chicken or a coherent thing that is not a chicken. And that's really the work that this um, uh, selective pathway is doing. Um, chickens are cute enough, but let, let's use some simpler stimuli uh, often used in the search literature, like uh, the letters T and L, uh, they too are roughly the same before um, attention gets there. They are uh, just two lines joined at a, uh, at a right angle. And uh, you, can, you can wave when you find a T. Uh, oh, good. There's a couple of people who are, are waving. Maybe you found both T's. Um, how did you do that? So as with the chickens, what we think you're doing is you're moving from L to L to L to L in a essentially serial manner until you stumble on the, uh, um, the T or you decide that there is no T present. Um, the experiments where we measure your reaction time allow us to get an estimate of how fast you can do that. And if we, uh, if we do the experiment with our T's and L's, we'd get some data like this. Um, you might get a target present slope of around 30 milliseconds an item um, in this particular 
uh, in this particular case. And you can take that uh, slope and depending on uh, specific assumptions about how you'd like to model search, you can use that as an estimate of the rate at which you are processing um, T's and L's. How fast are you going through that display? Doesn't necessarily require that you assume that you're going through them one after another, but it gives you the rate at which you can go through the, uh, um, through the display. So depending on exactly how you would model this, if you use relatively large, easy to resolve items like T's and L's, um, you're gonna come up with an estimate that you're doing somewhere between, let's say 20 or 50, 20 to 50 items every second, very fast, but not, uh, not, not sort of infinitely fast. Um, and you can think of this as, as uh, so some sort of binding mechanism where these um, simple lines are going through the bindery and coming out as T's and L's at the other end. And you're getting uh, to something like 20 or to 50 of those um, every second. Um, a difficulty here is that nobody thinks that you can actually go from an image on the retina to object recognition um, at that kind of rate, uh, in, in that kind of time. So uh, um, if it's 20 to 50 items per second, flipping that over, you're going to get an estimate that somewhere between 20 and 50 milliseconds, every 20 to 50 milliseconds, you identify another object. Nobody thinks you can do all of object recognition in 20 or even 50 milliseconds. Usual estimates are more like 100 to 200 even for simple objects. Um, and so what we would propose is what in computer science would be a pipeline architecture, but uh, in the real world we can think of as a car wash. Um, if we're thinking about a visual search car wash, items are going into the car wash maybe once every 50 seconds and coming out every 50 milliseconds, but um, there are multiple items in that car wash, multiple cars in that car wash at, uh, at any one time. We can make a more formal model of this by thinking about um, a diffusion model that uh, each of these blue dots you can imagine as a little car going into this visual search car wash. As it goes into the car wash, it starts uh, accumulating information towards a distractor identification, this would be, oh, you're an L, oh, this one's an L2. And if this one is the T that you stumbled on, eventually it accumulates enough information to say, oh, I found a T. But this accumulation might take 100, 200, 300 milliseconds or something of that sort. So in this vision, items are being selected in series and but they are being in effect processed asynchronously but in parallel. So the old fight about whether visual search is serial or parallel in this view that's a non-issue that the mod that 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 the the underlying search mechanism has both serial and parallel um, components to it. If you do your experiment one way, you'll see evidence for a serial process. If you do it another way, so for instance, dropping a big rock onto your car wash, you'll squash several cars at once and come to a, 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 more, a more parallel conclusion. So it's, um, uh, it, it's neither serial or parallel, and, and that's a fight not worth, uh, not worth fighting. The guided search part of guided search is to ask, okay, if you've got to select items into this binding car wash here, perhaps one after the other, what controls what it is that you are doing, um, uh, the, what, what, it, what, what controls what object you actually, uh, what actually select? Um, so let's, let's try illustrating this guidance part, again, by getting you to clap if you find a, well, you don't have to clap because you're all on mute. You got to go and wave if you find, or or toss small children in the air if you if you if you find the T. Uh, you ready? 
All right, so that's pretty trivial. I didn't tell you it was red. I didn't have to tell you it was red. That highly salient red item simply grabbed your attention in what we would label as a bottom-up kind of a way. That's bottom-up stimulus-driven um, guidance. Um, and if you did the experiment with a red T um, or just a salient T among uh, Ls, what you'd get now is um, a function where the reaction time by set size function was essentially flat um, because your attention is grabbed first time every time by the target. Um, you immediately go to the target. Um, now, if, if, you, if you made uh, one of the L's red, you'd go immediately to the L and it would be wrong and you'd have to move along from, from there. There's nothing about, you're not knowing that it's a T, it's just that the redness grabs your attention. Um, we can ask what sort of things would grab your attention. You can ask yourself, looking at this display, um, what pops out, to use the jargon of the search trade, what pops out, what grabs your attention? And you'll say, well, look, color grabs your attention. Um, Important to notice that it's relative color, not absolute color. The two boxes, the two items that are surrounded by a red box right now are exactly the same uh, purple. But if we go back, the one on the left pops out because it's very different from its neighbors. The one on the right, which is rather similar to its neighbors, does not pop out. Um, orientation works. Something about shape, we've never been quite sure what, uh, what it is about shape that pops out. Um, not everything pops out. You will perhaps not have noticed this X junction, um, even though everybody else is a T junction. Um, and uh, whoops, go back. There's a, a, a set of maybe a, a dozen, maybe a few more basic features that will support this kind of, of, of bottom-up stimulus-driven um, attention guidance. Uh, things like orientation or curvature, size, weird things like lighting direction, not things like uh, faces, um, a whole, if, if you are interested in cataloging uh, what does and does not seem to uh, pop out, uh, take uh, Todd Horowitz and I have written several articles where we sort of catalog the literature. This is, uh, I think, the most recent of our catalogs down here. Um, but we can use these uh, salient bottom-up features in a top-down, user-driven kind of way. So this time, I'll tell you that the T is red. And you can wave again when you find the T. There's the display. Yeah, that's nice and easy. What you should notice here is that your attention didn't necessarily immediately go to the T. But as you selected items, you selected red items. If you know it's red, there's no point to spending a lot of time analyzing black items. And if half of the items were red, the slope of that reaction time by set size function will drop in half as you uh, roughly in half, if guidance was perfect, it would drop all the way um, in half. And, and um, not because you start processing things more quickly, but because you are selecting things more effectively. Out in the real world, where not where, where the entire world isn't made up of T's and L's or chickens and, and mutant um, chickens, this sort of guidance strongly restricts your attention to, um, to items that are worth paying attention to. So hence this idea of guided search. Um, and you can think of guidance as a sort of a control box sitting on top of this selective um, uh, bottleneck, controlling what gets into uh, selection. So uh, the top down and bottom up was what guided search had in the good old days. I should mention that guided search six is guided search six because I learned a lesson from Anne Treisman's uh, famous feature integration model. Um, as more data uh, came in, she would evolve her model, which is a reasonable thing to do, except that people only would pay attention to and would attack 
her 1980 original feature integration model, and this would annoy her. Um, and so when I uh, started doing guided search models, I decided that when I had enough new stuff, I would give it a new number. So that if you want to tell me that the model is wrong, tell me that the current model is wrong. I know that my 1989 model is wrong. We've, take, we've collected data for the subsequent 30 years. So we're up to guided search six. Guided search six is now up to five different forms of guidance. I've shown you bottom up stimulus driven salience. I've shown you top down user driven um, uh, guidance by basic features. There's also guidance by value. If, uh, if you systematically reward people for, uh, for red items, they will tend to attend to red items, even if that's not relevant. Um, there's important work on the effects of history. If the last target was red, you're more likely to uh, guide your attention to red next time, even if that's not relevant, but the one I want to spend a little time on um, is, um, is search guidance. Um, and that's guidance by the properties of the, uh, of, of the larger search display. And we can illustrate that, I think. Ah, yes. OK, so I promise you that one of these boxes is hiding a horse. And your job um, well, we could bring up the chat if we wanted. Your job is to assert which of the boxes has a horse behind it. We don't really need to do this experiment. I know that you'll guess randomly. And if you were un uncovering boxes, you you'd, you'd have to uncover um, uh, yeah, n plus one over two of them on average to find the horse. Um, but if I keep the same boxes and put them in a scene, there's no more horse features here than there were a moment ago, but now you would not be guessing randomly. If you're so inclined, you can put a letter in, in, the, uh, in, in the chat, um, but what you will, um, you will presumably not be guessing randomly. There's the horse. Um, you know perfectly well that it could be at C, um, it can't be down there at the bottom at say B because that would be a ridiculously small horse. It can't really be at G because horses don't float in the air. Um, and, uh, oops, I'm going the wrong direction here. The scene guidance is a, a, perhaps the most important form of guidance. It wasn't in earlier guided search models in part, be at, or other people's models um, 20, 30 years ago, in part because we didn't have good ways of studying it um, in, in, in the lab. Now it's much easier to control scene stimuli um, and we can um, study what we always knew, which is that if, look, if you're looking for your cat, you just don't look on the ceiling unless you have a very unusual cat. Um, because cats are just not on the ceiling. It doesn't have anything to do with the uh, properties of the cat per se. It has to do with properties of the scene. So uh, five types of guidance, feature, top down and bottom up, uh, scene guidance, also value and history. We can talk more about those if people have uh, questions. But now let's um, expand to a, 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 a different piece of, uh, of the search mechanism. And this is sometimes talked about as, um, as, uh, as the functional visual field or um, alternatively as the useful field of view. So FVF for functional visual field, UFOV, U, um, UVO, U, uh, useful field, UFOV, for useful field of view, they're more or less the same. They show up in, in, in slightly different parts of the search literature. Here's the idea. Um, typically models of search uh, treated the entire visual field as being essentially homogeneous, though we always knew that wasn't true. It was just a matter of convenience. And we often designed our stimuli to control for factors like um, uh, 
the fall off in acuity with eccentricity. Um, but if we're thinking about search in the real world, or even search with this collection of T's and L's, um, imagine, or actually try, fixating at the end of this blue arrow. And without moving your eyes around, ask yourself which T you're going to find. And the answer is that there must be some sort of useful field or functional visual field around that point of fixation within which you could find the T and outside of which you can't, at least not until you move your eyes. Um, and that's the core idea of this, this functional visual field. Um, it's been casually thought about in the literature, particularly in the applied literature, like in the driving literature, as though this functional field was a spotlight within which you process everything and outside of which you process nothing. And that's not true. One of the important um, tidbits of, uh, of our more recent data and, and of guided six modeling is to make it clear that there is this functional field, but that doesn't mean that you process everything within um, the current field. Again, if we're doing a T versus L search, we're imagining that you're uh, moving your attention around, say, every 50 milliseconds. Your eyes are going to be fixated for um, maybe a quarter of a second at any given point before moving along. So if that functional visual field covers whatever it's covering on the screen now, 10 or 12 um, Ts and Ls, you're only going to be able to get to um, four, five, six of those during a single fixation. You're simply not going to be able to identify um, all of them at the same time. And we can see that uh, if we actually go and, um, and, and test it experimentally. So here's what we did. Um, you're looking, you, the observer, are looking for T's in, a, in just a nice regular uh, array of, of rotated L's. Your job is to, uh, to click on, on the T's and we're measuring your eyes. And as soon as you click on the T, everybody jiggles a little bit and a new T shows up someplace else. And we will collect lots and lots of eye movements. Um, what we can do at that point is to say for each fixation, um, we can measure the distance to the current target and we can derive a probability that from that distance, your next saccade will go to the target. In this sort of a task, um, you will, you know, there are tasks where you can fixate here and make a response to a target that's over there without moving your eyes. But under natural conditions like this, you'll move your eyes to the target. Um, and what you see on the, uh, in, on, in the graph on the right is on the x-axis, we've got the distance to the target in degrees. And on the right, uh, on the y-axis, we've got the probability that you're going to fixate on the target next. So even though these, this stops at about two degrees because uh, these T's and L's are separated by two degrees. Even if you're sitting at the next item over, um, so two degrees away from the target, the chance that you're going to fixate the target next and pick up the target next is only about 50%. Now, this doesn't mean that your error rate in this task is 50%. It means that some other fixation later will pick up the, uh, the target from, uh, from another place. But when you're fixated at one point, yes, there is a region around um, the target within which you could find the target. But fixating here does not guarantee that you will find the target even if it's right next door. And in other data, um, well, you can, if, if, if you're familiar with the, 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 um, the classic gorilla experiments and, and, or other inattentional blindness experiments, you can see how it could be that you're actually fixating more or less on an item 
and somehow not selecting it for processing um, by attention. I think this turns out to be a very important tidbit of information explaining um, a wide, uh, it's, it's part of what explains a wide range of important errors in, um, uh, in, the, in the world of search. These are sometimes called looked but failed to see errors. These are errors where the item is clearly visible to the searcher and the searcher didn't find it for some reason. And, what, and, and a key piece of understanding this is to understand that the ability, that the, the, the simple fact that you could recognize an object at this distance from fixation does not mean that you will recognize an object at, at, uh, um, at that distance. Um, yes, that's what I just said. Oh, and here's here's an illustration of this. Uh, um, don't look for the cat on the ceiling, but do look for the cat in this image. Um, and uh, we could, if uh, if they ever get the technology right, we could check your eye movements while you're searching around. I don't. It's going to depend a little bit on whether you're viewing this display on your iPhone or something. But if you've got a decent uh, size screen, uh, there's the cat. Um, it's vis perfectly visible enough. Um, well, Gil thinks she has to get very close to the display before she sees it. But um, you, 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 can, you can tell that that's a cat. Um, people routinely don't find, um, uh, uh, don't find the cat. The nice thing about this image is that bright red leaf all but guarantees that your attention will have gotten very close to the cat. Um, and if you're reasonably convinced that on your screen you can recognize the cat and you believe that your eyes got close to the cat, this illustrates the point that even when you know what you're looking for, simply fixating near the item isn't necessarily enough to, uh, to get you there. Now, the reason why this matters um, is, uh, it can be illustrated if we start doing things like tracking the eyes um, of radiologists as they look uh, here at mammograms searching for breast cancer. These are scan pads, illustrative scan pads um, of radiologists looking um, for uh, uh, um, cancer. The, the lesion is inside the red rectangle in each of these images. Um, the saccades are numbered in order. These are all error trials. Um, and going back to uh, uh, Kundel and his group at the University of Pennsylvania 40 years ago, there is in radiology a, a, a taxonomy that's been proposed for, uh, for errors based on, on eye tracking. Um, if you look at the left, you see what they would call a search error. Um, that's one where the observer looks at the image clearly, but never gets close enough to the target. They just didn't fixate the target at all. Um, in the middle, you have uh, a, what's known as a recognition error clear fixation on the target, but only one fixation. The eyes drop by for uh, whatever, a quarter of a second, and then go elsewhere, seemingly without understanding that what was right under the point of fixation um, is not in fact, uh, that they didn't recognize that as, as problematic. Um, and then there are uh, what are called decision errors. On the far right, you can see many fixations on or near the target um, presumably the radiologist recognized that there was something there. They just decided it wasn't cancer, right? That th these are ambiguous um, images and, and uh, you might sometimes simply misclassify them. Um, the recognition errors are um, for present purposes, arguably the most interesting. Right, you get your eyes to the right spot, but you somehow don't understand what you um, uh, what was um, right inside the functional visual field um, for that particular fixation, and you move off elsewhere. These are the sort of errors um, 
that that uh, are uh, are hard to explain in court. Uh, the, 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 the mammographers get sued with some regularity, and when when uh, when they miss a diagnosis, and what you end up with in court is a um, a, a discussion where the um, uh, the, the plaintiff's attorney, the, the, the people who are suing you, will put up the image on the sc- on the big screen, point to the target, and say, "Is that cancer?" And the expert that's been hired, or the de- de- the defending radiologist, says, "Yes, of course, it's cancer." And the question is, "Why didn't you see it?" And part of the answer is this: uh, uh, is this understanding of the way that functional visual fields work. It can be perfectly possible to have put your attention on this spot and still not have correctly selected the item that turns out to be um, uh, to, to be the cancer. Uh, we have not managed to get this particular piece of wisdom into the American legal system yet, by the way. It's, it's, a, um, uh, it's, it's an interesting applied problem here. So um, the functional field isn't just one thing. It makes sense to think about functional fields defined simply by acuity functions, and then other aspects of the functional field defined by the way that attention um, is deployed. So you can talk about a functional field for resolution based on acuity, um, and you can talk about aspects based on uh, attention. And this dissociation between looking at something and actually seeing something um, is, I think, at the heart of many of these look but fail to see kinds of errors in uh, in visual search. Um, Here's an example uh, from work that I did uh, some years back with Traft and Drew. What you're looking at here is a slice through the, uh, uh, through the chest, those big black regions are the lungs. Um, the blob in the center is your heart. You can see the little white ring discs. Those are your ribs with your backbone there at the bottom center. And um, here are, here, here's the eye movements of a radiologist as uh, he scrolls through the lung back and forth, looking for lung nodules. Lung nodules are signs of lung cancer. They're small, white, and round. The things that you're looking at that are look small, white, and round are vessels running through the lung. And so what the radiologist is looking for as they scroll around is something small, white, and round that appears and then disappears as though you were moving through a... Uh, a golf ball or something of that sort. And uh, separate talk, I can tell you, um, all, you know, about all sorts of interesting things about how uh, radiologists search through 3D volumes of image data. But here I just wanna mention that, uh, so there's, there's a particularly juicy lung nodule. Um, I just wanna mention uh, that we did something odd on the last trial, which is easier seen if I crank up the contrast. Uh, we put a gorilla in the lung. Um, those of you with uh, psych backgrounds will recognize this as an homage to the classic Simon's inattentional blindness demonstration. It wouldn't have needed to be a gorilla, but gorillas are gorillas are traditional. Um, and um, 20 of 24 of our radiologists failed to report the gorilla. Now, uh, why would you report a gorilla? You're looking for a uh, um, a little white blob. Um, We told them to do the task as they would in a clinical setting. If you're doing clinical radiology, say searching for signs of lung cancer, you always have two jobs. Find the thing you're looking for if it's there and also report out anything else of clinical significance, a so-called incidental finding. And uh, we wanted to argue that um, uh, that finding a gorilla would be of, of, of some clinical significance. Anyway, 20, 20 of 24 radiologists didn't mention it. And that means that when we asked them after the fact in the usual manner, did you see anything odd on the last trial? I don't know. Did you happen to see a gorilla? 
they say, oh, what are you talking about? And you show them the image and they say, oh my God, there was a gorilla there. Um, very important to point out that this is not a criticism of radiologists um, or of these specific radiologists. It's an illustration that um, radiologists are limited by the same uh, human search engine that the rest of us are limited by. Becoming a domain expert, and this has been shown now in multiple expert domains, becoming an expert changes the way you use your visual system and your search engine. It doesn't give you a new search engine in some fashion. So the limits that were there um, for um, those of us who are mere novices are also there for radiologists. And we can sort of imagine what happens. I mean, we, we were eye tracking. So we know that on average, um, they looked at the gorilla for about a little under a second. Um, they did, so these are typically probably what would be considered recognition errors. Um, and we can hypothesize about what would happen. You can imagine a fixation, let's say here at this bright red dot, you can imagine that they are guiding attention um, to small, white, and round in the quarter of a second or so that they are fixated here, they might attend to say four things that are sort of small, white, and round, and simply never devote any attention to something that's big, black, and shaggy, and end up um, and end up missing it. That's in any case the hypothesis about what's going on in this particular case. Um, it's interesting because, as I say, um, radiologists are expected to um, report out. Uh, incidental findings. And this might explain part of why that is an imperfect, um, an imperfect process. Oh, I should say in passing, I don't think I put these slides in. Um, I, I should say in passing that uh, when we published this, radiology social media lit up. Um, I didn't even know there was radiology social media, but there's always a comments section these days. Um, and um, the, the, the one of the um, more interesting comments was roughly speaking, this is a stupid experiment because um, if I'm looking at a lung, there are no gorillas. Incidental, if I'm looking for lung cancer, an incidental finding is pneumonia, not gorilla. And so we've done a, a series of, of, of experiments in the lab, not with radiologists, showing that we can get people to miss um, things that they know they should be looking for. And we don't, this, this kind of error does not rely on, uh, on the surprise of a totally unexpected gorilla, but we can, uh, but that's a separate story. Um, for present, what I wanna say is that um, we think that at the heart of many of these look but fail to see, that's what LBFTS stands for, look but fail to see errors there is this function. Oh, these data are actually from uh, radiologists looking at, at mammograms rather than the TNL data I showed you before. Um, radiologists sitting one degree away from a, uh, a lesion in the breast, the chance that they're going to move their fixation to that lesion on the next fixation is again, only about 50%. Um, this doesn't mean that you're going to miss everything, it means that you're going to not process everything that's available to you within a single fixation. So um, how are we doing for time? Oh, good. Okay. One last topic. Let's say a quick word about um, uh, search templates, a very popular topic in the, uh, in the, in the visual search literature these days. Um, where the basic question is, if I tell you, look for lung cancer or look for this bear um, or whatever, you must have some representation in your brain of that target. What is actually in your head? And that, that usually gets uh, called a, a, a search template. What's, what's in your head and where is it? 
Um, clearly, this is by definition in memory someplace. You remember that you're looking for a bear. Um, but uh, where in memory, uh, where in memory is it? One of the leading hypotheses about the home for search templates is that search templates live in visual working memory. There's a big and important literature um, on this, probably contributed to by several people on this call this morning. Um, let me do a, 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 a quick demo that complicates this. Uh, issue, um, a demo that Nirit certainly will be highly familiar with. But uh, what I want to do is get you to make some templates. So memorize these four items. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not tricking you or anything this time. Uh, I just really want you to memorize those. And I also want you to memorize these and these nice little metal bat there and some bellows and let's add four more and some red currents i guess and so on um and uh, so, so you've got these 16 templates now lodged in your brain we know that you're good at uh, at remembering objects. So I have great faith that you're able to do this. And then we can do what's called a hybrid search. Hybrid is standard visual search. You're looking for a target among distractors. In hybrid search, you're looking for multiple possible targets among distractors. And so now you're looking for any of these 16 um, items. And uh, you can, again, wave if you find uh, 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 targets. Yeah, no problem, right? You did, did I highlight them? Yeah, there we go. You probably found both the drink and the uh, the game board there. Um, here we can do another one. Nobody's waving. That's oh no, somebody was waving, but that's what's known as a false alarm because there are no targets in this one. And you repeat this a bunch of times. What you discover. Um, discover a couple of interesting things. Reaction times are a, a linear function of the visual set size. Um, and interestingly, uh, a logarithmic function of the memory set size is now memory set size on the uh, on the x axis here. That's interesting. But what's important for present purposes is that there's uh, no problem doing the task. And we've done this with um, people memorizing 100 objects. It takes you longer to search for any of 100 objects, but there's no difficulty in, in, doing, um, in doing the task. Um, and that is important, whoops, for the um, question of templates, because nobody thinks that you can put 16 items into visual working memory, certainly not at, at, at anything like high resolution. Um, and if you think you can get 16 in there, absolutely nobody thinks you can put 100 um, in there. It, it, it's, it's just, um, you know, the, the usual capacity is, you know, three or four or something like that. So the templates for um, this sort of hybrid search sort of by definition cannot be living in um, visual working memory. They would seem to be living in long-term memory. Specifically, we've uh, um, appropriated from Nelson Cowan the term um, activated long-term memory, the piece of long-term memory that is rel uh, relevant to the current task. Um, but look, there's a huge body of literature showing working memory relationship to, um, uh, to visual search. Um, and I would, I would not argue that somehow that is all flawed literature. I think what's going on, and I'll end with this point, um, is that the literature has failed to distinguish 
between two types of template. We talk about a search template, but there are really um, two, at least, two different templates at work here. What's in working memory and what the data on, on search and working memory show is that what's on work in working memory are what you can call a guiding template. If you hold green in working memory, if I load your working memory with you know, this green and I say, I'm gonna test that later, you will tend to deploy your attention to green um, stuff. And um, that's the template. Well, if we go back to the gorilla in the lung, the template that um, guides your attention to small, white, and round is the sort of guiding template that lives in um, working memory. The interesting debate there is, is there just one guiding template at a time or can you guide to two colors at a time and so on, but very small numbers and very crude properties. Um, once you have attended to an item, there is a target template that comes into play that says, okay, look, I attended to this small white round thing. Is it cancer? That's a different template. That's a much more elaborated thing that lives in long-term memory somewhere. This doesn't mean that um, the working memory literature is wrong. It just means it's incomplete, that you need to think about two templates that fall, that, that are, if you like, if, if, if you don't want to split them up, you can think of the search template as having two different aspects, a working memory aspect that guides attention and a long-term memory aspect that tells you whether you have now attended to the thing that you were actually, um, uh, that you were actually searching for. Um, this is the idea is not unique to me. Orton Oliver's have a nice version of it uh, in, a, in a recent visual cognition article. Other people do too. So in, in summary, let's take a quick tour through guided search. Um, you've got a stimulus out in the world. Um, it gets uh, entered into the visual system in, uh, where you've got a non-selective pathway giving you ensemble statistics and gist and things like that everywhere across the field um, to identify specific items in that display you need to select them into this selective uh, pathway access to that selective pathway is um, guarded by this guidance mechanism um, with its five different forms of guidance, top down, bottom up, scene, value, and history. Um, the item that you select uh, is then matched against the targets that you are holding in um, as target templates somewhere up in long-term memory. If you found it, great. If you didn't, you can iterate this process until you find it or decide to quit. The question of when you decide to quit is an interesting topic um, in, it, in its own right. Um, at each one of these selections, your eyes are pointed somewhere that constrains what you can process at any given moment um, in the, uh, and, and that's where you get this idea of a, a, a functional visual field. And you're probably selecting these items once every 50 milliseconds, but taking two, 300 milliseconds to process even a simple one to the point of identification, giving you this idea of a, uh, a search mechanism that is neither serial, purely serial nor purely parallel, but, uh, but some combination of both. And look at that, it's nine o'clock East Coast on the nose. That seems like a good place to stop. Vastly more details if you want in the recently published Guided Search 6 paper. And I would be happy to field questions in any way you like, even if Ellie Pelly says that he didn't find the cat. So I'm, I'm sad for Ellie, but what you gonna do? 
All right, thank you. I would like to ask everybody to unmute yourself and let's uh, give Jeremy a big applause uh, for a wonderful talk. And I'm opening the stage for questions, of course. We'll unshare so that I can see people. Are you are you directing traffic or shall I? Um, I could, I could. I mean, I see two uh, questions in the, I mean, people could start asking, but I'm happy to. Um, I, see, I see Yoni, I think. Yoni, do you want to ask something? Go ahead. Uh, yes. Thanks, Jeremy, for a fascinating talk. My question is just about the guiding template that you talked about at the end and about the assumption that it has to be in working memory. So my question is, if you think that long-term memory could also act as a guiding template, and if not, then how you could explain that you could a gaze could get, could be guided to mm -hmm. targets that could not be a, 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 like like a familiar a familiar face. That's something that you it's it hard to think about in terms of working memory, right? Um. So uh, I, I should say that there is uh, in the working memory literature or in, in the four little color box literature, um, the, the, the very large four little color box literature out there, there's a lot of discussion about whether those items are represented purely in working memory or whether after you know a, a, a second or two, they transition to um, long-term memory. Um, and I would, uh, the, the, the first thing I would say um, is that uh, my commitment is to the idea that there are target templates and guiding templates that can be thought of uh, separately. And if you wanted to say, I've got convincing evidence that not all the guiding uh, templates are living in, um, uh, in, in working memory, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll surrender on that point very rapidly, and, and that's cool. That that that's um, that wouldn't uh, that would not disturb me. I think you were also alluding to the possibility that the guiding template could be guiding to a familiar face, for instance. Um, there, I would be willing to get into an argument because I don't really think that the evidence is good there. Um, I think that. Uh, guidance is um, limited to fairly uh, basic, uh, to, to, to these basic sort of pre-attentive um, features and that the evidence for um, a sort of high level semantic guidance is, is, is um, weak at present. Now, I should add that a, uh, a, a visiting grad student who would have been in my lab at, if it had not been for COVID and who has now, um, uh, we, is now in Chris Oliver's lab. Um, her, her plan is, is to show that semantic guidance is a real thing. Um, so Guided Search 7 might have to change its mind about that. Um, but at the moment, I think that the pieces that I would be committed to are, um, a template that guides your attention, um, but is basically rather crude. It doesn't guide to this particular shade of blue, it guides to blue. Um, and, it, and, and I don't think it guides to, um, you know, to your mother's face or you know, that, that sort of thing. And a target template that is highly precise and tells you whether you, well, if it's precise, if you've got a precise target, um, says, you know, oh yes, I have uh, actually located Jan Atkinson, right? I have a very precise Jan Atkinson template. Um, I cannot guide my attention to her, but I can identify her once, once she has been appropriately selected. So is it guidance at all, Jeremy? Is, it, is what guidance at all? Activated long-term memory. Um, so it I seems think, that it's not, not even guiding anything, right? So I, I, I think it's not. Um, 
but that that's a that that is an ideological position rather than a um, an absolute. You know, I can defend that with buckets of of data. Um, if somebody can, uh, uh, they're they're difficult experiments to do because of of, of the eight million. Uh, sort of low-level visual controls that you always need. But if somebody could show that, look, I've got these 16 weird objects in my brain that I'm searching for in a hybrid search, and that I can search this world of, of distractor objects in a guided kind of a way based on the meaning of those objects, um, I would be surprised. But you know, then, then that's that's that would be that would require a change in the model. The, the, the model at the moment would say that, um, that those target templates um, are there as sort of the end point of the search, but are not participating in the guidance of the search. Mm -hmm. uh, Louis, do you wanna ask again? Yeah, I wanna have, uh, the, uh, my original question was, uh, you know where you have the list of the, uh, I think, five types of attentional yeah, yeah. guidance or capture? I'm not sure what was the title there, right? Um, it's always the question, um, but I wonder what's, what's your opinion about it. So history, value, and scene, aren't they all just top-down attention? Well, okay. Guidance. So the, um, Why so, do so we two need th two things to say about that? Subtypes. For, for, first thing is that um, yeah, if, if you wanted to um, group everything into you know six types of guidance because you were going to split up history into priming and and uh, and, and memory or something like that separately. Um, yeah, th th there's some arbitrariness in in saying exactly five. Um, the idea of grouping it all into uh, top down and uh, bottom up. Well, let's leave scene aside because that, that would be complicated to decide whether that's top down or bottom up anyway. But if you want to put um, uh, the, the history and value things just into a form uh, as a form of top down guidance, um, uh, that is a defensible position. Um, in fact, I, I claimed it was true um, and, and could perfectly happily argue about it. I, the distinction that I made once upon a time was there's guidance from the stimulus that, um, and there's guidance from the contents of your, um, of your mind. And history and value are pretty clearly guidance from properties of your mind. Um, I split those forms of guidance off um, uh, to because they do have different properties than standard top-down guidance. Top-down guidance is much more volitional, for instance, than priming or value effects. But really, because um, uh, uh, Ed O and company published an influential paper a few years back. Um, arguing for top down, uh, bottom up, and history separate, and and they they very deliberately made an argument against the idea that we should just think of history effects as as uh, top down guidance. Um, but but really, uh, in some fashion, this is uh, you know a, a boxology. Uh, a, you know, how, how you like to draw the pictures of your model um, question. Uh, if you are inclined to lump things together, yeah, okay. That, 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 uh, but I would think that scene, I, scene guidance is simply location, knowledge of location, prior knowledge no, of no, location, No, no, right? uh, no. Scene, scene guidance, uh, if, you, if you want, you can start splitting scene guidance up into different forms of, um, of scene guidance, uh, going back to Biederman, at least there's the distinction between semantic um, scene guidance and syntactic 
guidance syntactic having to do with the structure of the scene, you know that the objects need to obey the rules of gravity, semantic having to do with the meaning of the objects, um, you know, even though your toothbrush could be uh, sitting on the floor, gravity will be perfectly happy with that. Um, uh, you know to look for your toothbrush on, on near the sink um, because of the semantics um, of the uh, uh, of the situation. Um, so you could get into an interesting question about um, whether all of some whether any of scene guidance could be thought of as as sort of bottom up and um, stimulus driven. But um, but I, I think from uh, the the vantage point of uh, of, of uh, clarifying the forces at work here, what scene guidance does for you is it points out that it's not just about the properties of the target, right, or even of the distract you know of, of dis discrete distractors. You get you you get beautiful evidence for scene guidance. Um, even if the target is not in the display. So if you walk into um, the bathroom and you're looking for the toothbrush, your search will be strongly guided, even if it turns out that the toothbrush is not present. There's nothing about the toothbrush's um, features that are necessary for that guidance. It's all, about, it's all about the properties of the scene. So it makes sense, it seems to me, to keep that separate while acknowledging, yeah, yeah, it's got top-down aspects to it too, but it's a different thing than saying, I am going to top-down guide to red stuff. So there's there's one hand up I see. Yeah, um, yeah, okay. so um, I'll just read a few uh, things oh, from the, the chat. So um, great talk, thanks, uh, Gilly said, and um, yeah, Enyam Com, Komla, you are the one who wants to ask a question, so um, you're most welcome to do that, and I'll continue reading from the chat later. I, yes, uh, thank you very much for the for the great and fantastic talk. Um, um, I do like um, I do like your more matured explanation regarding the fact that our um, 20, twenty out of twenty four radiologists missed the gorilla, and you do say that it is because um, they are all basically working due to the limitations of the, the search engine. Um, I teach, I teach uh, optometry students and I teach them ah. to image recognition <laughs> with uh, OCTs and virtual field um, data. And you do come across the same problem. They are looking at it and they can't recognize what they are seeing. Um, how do we, based on what you, do you have any thoughts on how we can get over that limitation, you know, of seeing and not recognizing at, at an earlier level? What, what do you think are the factors that contribute to, say, like you said, the experts seem to use the same search engine, but in different ways. Do you have any thoughts on how to get? So if you ask uh, radiologists, yeah, what they what they do, um, and 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 indeed uh, a, a variety of, of sort of domain experts will tell you that one of the <clears throat> ways that they attempt to uh, uh, avoid, particularly these sort of incidental finding kind of errors, is um, a, a mental checklist. That um, yeah yeah yeah, I know that my main job, let's say, is to uh, look for lung cancer. But before I get out of this um, image, I'm going to run through my mental, uh, my, my generic checklist, check the ribs, check for pneumonia, boom, boom, boom. And I'm not going to do perhaps as detailed a, 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 a search, but I'm going to reconfigure my search engine to do a, 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 a quick search for these other possible but less likely um, kinds of events. Now, another technique that um, some radiologists have, ha have offered up, um, and, and I don't think anybody's ever actually uh, done a formal, oh, actually, maybe there are. There's not much formal literature on this, um, is to say, when I get 
a, 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 a case to look at. I like to look at it first without knowing what I'm supposed to be looking for, right? I mean, I know that this is a lung. I'm not like gonna be totally, you know, oh my goodness, I wonder what part of the body I'm in today. Um, but I'm not gonna go and look at the referral slip that says, uh, uh, does Mrs. Jones have pneumonia? I wanna look at the image first um, and see what comes out. And then I'll go and check for, um, for what, uh, what, what I should be strictly uh, guiding for. Now with both the checklists and this sort of uh, look at it naively technique, um, both of those are gonna add to search time. And in, in real world situations, one of the standard problems is that the, the workload is unending. And so there's also pressure to get on to the next case. Um, what we know from some, again, from, uh, from some of the radiology literature is if you're gonna find it, you're gonna find it quickly, probably. Um, you will find more if you search for a long, long time. Um, but you really don't have a long, long time. You can't, you can't devote the whole day to this one case. Um, so you're gonna quit. And there's evidence that if you, uh, th th that as you search longer, you reach a point of diminishing returns where you're more likely to kick up a false positive than a, uh, a true positive um, finding. So, the place for interesting research would be to see if we can figure out, you know, if there's some way to tell the observer in whatever the task is, you've reached that point of diminishing returns. It's not worth it to you to keep going here. You're more likely to come up with a dud than, than, than something real. But if you're quitting here, um, you know, maybe you want to give it a little more time. But there's, the, I don't know, is that an answer to a question that you asked? Um, it's a it, yeah sure it, I think it's very helpful I'll take the two points on um, one uh, looking at the data naively and also running through the uh, mental checklist yeah well if, if if anything interesting shows up in in the uh, in the optometric world with that uh, write a paper about it that'd be cool. Um. Jeremy, uh, Gadi Bloom Rosen said a great talk. Really gives insights. Thanks. Um. Gilly Nave also said, great talk, thanks. Eileen Cowler, nice talk, Jeremy. Um, Helen Ross said that she couldn't see the cat either. Um, Hagit, <laughs> uh, Hagit said, are you guiding, are the guiding templates also represented or work in top-down, bottom-up manner? Can it be controlled for in the lab? So this is... <laughs> So the guiding templates, so the, the, the guiding templates, uh, I, I, I think do have both top down and bottom up um, aspects to them. The top down aspect to it is if I tell you, mm -hmm. you know, you're looking for a red thing um, that you will be able to generate a guiding template that lets you look for red things. Um, the working memory literature strongly suggests a um, uh, at least a version of this sort of guidance that is not under your volitional control. And that's the evidence for that are these experiments where you say, um, uh, you know, we're gonna do a dual task. I want you to hold in memory this particular uh, red box. And then I'm going to get you to do something else. And you discover that even though the red box is totally irrelevant to the search task, you still end up uh, preferentially directing your attention to red things. So I suppose that would be a more bottom up or at least an, a, an, a more automatic version of, um, uh, of, of a guiding template, a guiding template that you didn't mean to put into place in any case. Okay, I hope this answers um, her question. I also have a question about uh, if you think that um, the guided search or actually 
would uh, change if you would actually carry, a, carry it out in a 3D world. So while most of the, even the, the radiologist, um, um, the radiology tasks were but all I assume in a 2D, uh, although uh, the radi going in to, uh, through the medical images, it is kind of like uh, mentalizing into a 3D um, form or structure, but it, the vision is actually exposed to a 2D surface. And I'm wondering if you think that in a real world, we're like looking at for the toothbrush or for the cat, but in a real situation, are things going to be different? Um, so I, I think that the, the basic principles will um, stay similar. The, the radiology example is interesting because the 3D volumes of image data that make up like a lung CT are very different from the 3D world as you look out the window because um, it's a stack of uh, correlated but but separate 2D images. You, you, you aren't looking through um, space in, in, a, in that kind of 3D. But um, in, in the 3D world, there is some evidence that you can guide deliberately to uh, different planes in depth, um, certainly. And if you think about it, um, uh, sort of scene guidance factors are, uh, are, are definitely going to be in play. Well, if you think about that, the, the, um, my horse example earlier in, in the talk, if you're looking for a horse, the, the template, the guidance to size is going to be dependent in a real world search on the 3D notion of how big a horse should be. So, you know, if the horse, I don't know in that, in that particular image, if the horse was um, uh, you know, one degree of visual angle, if you put that one degree of visual angle horse on the top of uh, a, a, of a mountain peak, uh, it, 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 it's, it's suddenly ridiculous as, as a horse, the world's most gigantic horse. And so, so guidance in the real world um, is, will be using those features in a 3D kind of way. That said, there's a great deal about um, uh, search in the real world that is not really captured in, um, in these sort of models because um, uh, the, the constraints on real world search, a lot of the constraints on real world search have to do with um, really motor acts that are moving at a much slower rate than the sort of uh, you know, 50 milliseconds an item selection that we're talking about. The eye, your, your eye movements, are slower, your head movements are markedly slower. If you're actually looking for your cat around the house, you know, the, the, the rate limiting step is, is, is you moving around the house, not how many um, furry objects in, in the living room you can attend per second. So th there's a lot of work to be done about real world search, but, but I think these mechanisms will continue to be operating. Okay, wonderful. Um, I, I assume um, it's already uh, 25 past. Maybe um, we should uh, call it call it a day, call it a talk. It's only morning. Yeah, I know. But yeah, yes. actually, you you can call it a day. No, we're not going to call. Right. Nobody's actually going to call it a day. I was just thinking maybe <laughs> we have other things to do. Um, there is there is another uh, hand up and uh, um, I can also direct people to write to you. Uh, would you Would you like to continue answering questions? Sure, or? yeah, obviously anybody who's got questions about stuff, feel free to send me a, uh, send me a note and, uh, and okay, I look one forward to seeing many of you in real life one of these days. It's great to see um, all sorts of folks who I haven't seen in person for a long time, including, for instance, Lucia Vina, who is probably only sitting two miles away from me at this very moment, and I haven't seen for years. Anyway, so thanks.
Thank you very much for a great talk, really. Um, and uh, okay. yeah, I hope um, we'll be uh, uh, seeing uh, each other soon. And um, of course, um, if you come up with the um, guided search uh, seven, yes, we wanna <laughs> we wanna have it uh, be presented here, of course. As as my ninety two year old father would say, I should live so long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.